Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be here this afternoon. Um, so I'll start. Um, Stephanie Correa, born to Stephen and Umbelina Campbell on April the 28th, 1930. She was called Scout by her father as she went everywhere with him. He taught her how to whistle about the plants and trees in the forest and to fish. Since she was small, he was draw she was drawing and painting pictures of Jesus and Our Lady, which he sold to her mother's friends at Santa Rosa in the northwest of Guyana, where she grew up with her eight siblings. She became a pupil teacher at the Martindale Primary School, and then her family moved to Georgetown. She went to training College of Education. There she met E.R. Burroughs who saw her ability in drawing and painting and put her in a room to do that. She said he told her no sewing and craft for you. She qualified as an A grade teacher. She married Vincent Correa on August the 27th, 1955. Climb Every Mountain done in 1998. This was acrylics done on canvas and this is her life story here. In the corner at the top, she's portraying where she came from, which was in the Northwest, her Amerindian heritage. On her cheek, there are two rings signifying her marriage. Then one string pulling away from that marriage is her creativity, this, which is in the center there, of all that she wanted to do, but tied Again, by the line at the bottom, which is our eight children there, and the mountains that you see on there are many operations in her life. She had eight operations in her life, signifying what is the top there, which is use of the Tamari figure as well as periods of sunshine, happiness, etc., in her life. So this is what she did in 1998. In the corner where you see the buildings there with kind of smoke coming out, that represented the city of Georgetown. So this was her done in 1998. At home as a housewife and mother of eight children, she continued to paint in watercolors and acrylics, early 60s and 70s. Kanaima was done in 1972 in acrylics. One of her earlier pieces, um, and it's done on canvas, acrylic on canvas. As you can see, Makanaima, which is one of the, I won't call it a myth. This is one that is introduced by the Amman people that they truly believe in, that he turns himself into the animals in the forest and he can be a part of it. So this one was done in 1972. Some of these were hung in a gallery on Main Street, which was above Frandeck. When her last child was two in 1972, she was also using clay, making sculpture pieces of Amerindian men and women, which were hung on wood using epoxy done in stains. She then made some into bases for lamp. And the, this is one that was a, ba um, a base for a lamp. The lampshade was made from the basketry that was done on TB Siri. That was the top, and this was the base. She made into pots using slabs, pinch pots, made from coils. Most of these always were adorned with things from her heritage, beads, feathers, cotton twine, seeds, and petroglyphs. She joined a class in the National Park done by Mr. Varney. She did intensive research on the clays from different parts of Guyana. She learned how to take out the impurities, tested them, and knew where to find the best clay. In 1974, she was offered a scholarship in the United States by a Baptist minister to learn how to throw on the wheel. There she did many pieces in stoner. These two here were sculptures too that she did using stains. 
a representation of the PI man in both, in both cases. This one had his rattle with feathers with the, the child he was taking care of. The other one was put like if he was in a boat there. And the top there was the, um, his rattle there. So this is one of her stoneware pieces with a cover that she did in 1974. So she brought these to Guyana in her suitcases, which at that time were not packed properly, as those were thrown off the plane. She lost many of those pieces, and these are a few that I still have. This is another one that was done in a slab form, in stoneware with glazes, and three other little pieces there. After returning, she developed her own style of ceramics using the petroglyphs, Amerindian designs which were intensely researched and documented as to origin and meaning. These were used to make jewel boxes, effigies, wine sets, coffee sets, salad bowls, spice jars, pots, and more bowls. Mom had so many ideas for the uses of that clay. She always said she was an earth person. She loved earth tones and the red color of the clay. She tested all the clays brought to her from different parts of Guyana, and they were tested in the kiln with glazes. And she learned to use the white clay made into a slip, which she used on the red clay and carved through. She mixed the slip with different oxides to get different colors. She also made her own glaze non-toxic using the red clay. She was one of the founder members of the Guyana Women Artists Association, which was formed in 1987. The first exhibition done in 1988, 60 Years of Women Artists in Guyana, a retrospective exhibition from 1928 to 1988. This is the poster that she did for that exhibition. And as you can see, it's from 1928 to 1988. This is one of the pictures of her actually on the wheel there, and pieces that she was doing. This was at the Yamanayana, 1988. In the central piece, you have the mural that she did in 1988, which is called Ancestral Images. And she was trying there to make sure that she could capture what went on actually in a village. The pots that were found were integral to their cooking, etc. that was put in the middle. And then she used the beads and seeds that are usually used on their adornments, on their lap cloths, as well as a piece of a hammock which they used. As you can see with the feathers, that is to represent the chief leader of the village. And over onto your right, no? Yes. The Tumeri figure, which is also referred to as Earth Mother. And this piece, when she made it, it was made in the form of a puzzle. Because of her earlier pieces, which she hung on wood using the epoxy as the paste, and then later on they fell off, she said, OK, I'll do a piece that is done in the form of a puzzle. And each little ring that is inserted there has a screw which screwed it onto the back, even though it had the pace. So this piece is one that I still have, and which I'm trying to get the government of Guyana to buy, so that they can have it, because they do not have a lot of her ceramic pieces. They have her paintings. And this is a piece that was done in 88, the first exhibition, which I think should be owned and seen by not only the people of Guyana, but those who are passing through Guyana. And there at the bottom, you can see some effigies as well. You can see teapots, etc. Mom taught her sons, Richard, Paul, and Peter, and myself, and a group of housewives who formed their own group and opened a shop on Lamaha Street called Lamacraft. They, in turn,
taught many others. I think that piece is here. So through here, you can see the wide variety of work that was done. The piece that you see right in the middle, which you can see showing up there, that was a piece that she did in 1972, I think it was, for the first Cari Festa. And the one that was next to it, that was done when I think we had a visit, oh, our president went to the Queen in England and they took the piece. That piece there was for the, the mother of the Queen. So that was the piece that was there and it was done, one of our legends that was done in that part there. So you can see the wide range that is there and the pieces that were slipped with the white slip that are at the back, in the background. And the ones to the front, that's a salad bowl and a salad set there. Um, so the wide range, the spice jars, spice jars, it's right to the side, but you can't see that in this picture. And these are effigies, which many don't know, but they were burial pots where the bones were actually put inside and those were what people were buried in. And mom developed this style over the years and using the ears there, she used the cotton twine that was used in the hammocks as well as seeds and beads from there and sometimes she would add feathers to those. Here you have some more pots that were done with glazes and as you can see on that one there, that's the white clay that is carved through with glazes around it. And to the other side, the adornments that you see on the side of the pots and the white that is showing there, that's the white slip on the red clay, as well as the ashtray that is used in front. Same thing, slipped pots on the red clay and carved through. Here is a a set of goblets. These goblets were done, I think, by mom and my brothers to Banks the IH. They wanted a whole collection to give us gifts. And they asked for the wine decanters. So here we have first exhibition, 1988, Yamanayana, 28, from 1928 to 1988, commemorating 60 years of women art. She's there speaking with Mr. Desmond Hoyt, the then president, and she's standing in front of her display, which on the walls you can see two of the legends that were done. The one over on this side, I think, was the story of the Kamaka tree, and I think that is in the Tate House collection. And the one on the other side was, um, oh Lord, what's her name? Rain, rainstorm. The lady that's stuck in the hole. <laughs> yes, the warrior who were from the sky people shot that bird and the bird fell through the hole and he took his ladder and he climbed down. And she was trying to climb behind him and she got stuck in the, the hole that was at the top and her name was rainstorm. So whenever you saw the rain falling, you knew she was crying. So he, when he ventured down and he came to earth, not only one bird he saw, but he saw birds and animals too, which he then said his people can stay and live there. So that's rainstorm on the one side, and this was the um, Kamaka tree, where is another legend that there was a tree and the animals couldn't find food, and the rat went to the tree, and they saw him getting fat, and another animal followed him, and when they came to it, they found why he was getting fat, because this tree produced so many different things to eat. And he said, why are you sharing this alone? And that's how they found that tree. So those were two legends that she did there. And as you can see, the other part is there, and to the one side there, you have, um, I think that was a, um, like a, um, a mosaic done in pieces of clay. So the other piece that I told you about, which she did the base as a man, that was the top there of that lamp, which was done with the basketry there. 
And this is the group from Lama Craft that was formed in Lama Hall Street. We have Nicholas there, sitting next to Sabina. So he was taught, and Irene is way up in the corner there, that's one of mommy's first students. And the lady to the front was one of mommy's first students, Marjorie. So the others that you see there was young artists that were taught by those ladies that she taught Lama Craft there. She freely gave her knowledge of ceramics and designs and many adopted the use of the Amerindian motifs and petroglyphs. Whatever she had learned, she taught them. This was the, the girls that she taught. Her exceptional pupils from the first group was Irene Gonzalez and Desri Fernandes that she referred to as her best, the best of her students. Both joined the Ghana Women Artists Association and did excellent pottery over the years. Mom was called upon to test and look over the works of the third year students at Borough School of Art in the ceramic field. She always put her hand into the pots to see if there were any roughness or pieces of, of clay left there. Turn them over to see the bottom, asking if the piece could be put on their polished or glass tables. Mom was a teacher who wanted her students to strive to put out their best in whatever they did and was always there to offer advice. Giving freely of her time and energy, she used wood, gas, and electric kilns and could advise on all of them. She received two medals from the government of Guyana, the Medal of Service and the Golden Arrow of Achievement. She did work for many exhibitions, both local and international, took part in different festas from the first in 1972. After many years of throwing on the wheel, she was told she had angina, and the coldness and strength needed to send the pieces on the wheel was not good for her heart. She turned again to sculptures and painting in watercolor and acrylics. That is the legend of her people. So there you have, again, the P.I. Man, which was done acrylic on canvas again and there. And she developed a style of spattering, which she put in the background there. Behind the P.I. Man, you see the Tamari figure, or what is known as Mother Earth. And around him was all of the animals that he made use of her of in his chant, because they were all present there when he was healing those people. The dancers that you see at the bottom was from that special dance that they did with their, with their um, the sticks that they held in their hands. So she did a series of this, and when you enter, you can also see another one there, which she gave to Mr. David D. Carey's in 1998. Over there on your right was a piece she did in, in, in cloth using, I think was um, um, fabric paint. Fabric paint on cloth that she did there. I can't remember the year. I, again, we have here, again, series of the PI man and his different helpers. You have the snake, you have the eagle, you have the tiger that was up in the corner there on the left-hand side. And with him, you always see him with his rattle. So he has his different helpers there. On the other side, the same thing. In cooperation of the different helpers that he needed to heal someone. In the corner to your left, on the left-hand side, you have the tiger, you have the snake, you have the the eagle there, and his rattle. These were watercolors. As you can see, she's also portraying her people, the Amerindians, burden bearers, the women who produced the cassava bed, who fetched the cassava, who actually did the work there, the pounding of it. And this is a tumor pot. This I also have. 
This was the traveling pot, I call it. This pot went to an exhibition in England, which at the time she could not attend because of illness. So surely she did start, but God made her turn back at the airport because she didn't have a visa to pass through America. So this is the tomb pot, which is used by the Armenian people, and it has a round bottom, which they, they put onto the stones, and this pot is kept with your pepper pot inside, boiling and adding and boiling and adding. And the little pieces that are round is the bones of all the different um, meats that were put inside. So this was her interpretation of that. And it's done with the line design, similar to the basketry. And that is done with, with glazes on it and it's glazed on the inside. And the piece at the bottom is what rests um, the pot there. Okay. In the last exhibition in 1999, she painted a series of paintings about her life, her origins, her childhood with her father, and what she learned from him. Six of these were bought for the National Collection. She said that was her last exhibition, and that the year 2000 was for evangelizing. Her friend Marjorie Budhagen, fellow founder artist, died in May 2000, and mom, on the 17th of July, 2000, at 70. Her work lives on. I will now read you this poem that she wrote in 1992, when she was surrounded by all the noise around her that was deteriorating her health. She was crying out to the president. She was writing to the police on a constant basing, basis to get that noise nuisance law be passed. They tell me I should relax as drugged obscenities pour out of walking zombies whose only preoccupation is when the next fix will be. And a brawl or two is not a miss to pass the time. They say I should be with it as satanic songs beat out death knolls within my head. Just inebriated morons having fun at the new beer garden next door. Regardless, regardless of the tortured souls panting for the sound of silence, they suggest I should meditate as I draw a fine line or ponder on my color scheme while the drink struck jingle jangle bottles all day outside my studio window. Or the boy next door methodically hits the zinc fence with his cricket ball. They complain. I do not produce enough. She was always known for quality and quantity. And when I say my airspace is invaded day and night, they do not understand cocooned as they are in elegant seclusion. They wonder, will she survive? Can she hang on to that thin line between collapse and sanity? The gold, the glory is embedded forever in this crucible. Will it forever burn and never find surcease? Why do the people always per persecute their artists? 